Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Colossians today, if you would please. Colossians chapter 1. As you're turning there, we'd like to recognize uh, some of those who are visiting with us today. We're glad to have Mariah Briggs here from Erie. Glad to have you with us. And uh, Richard Butts from Texas, Pastor Butts from Texas. Good to have you here. He was here last time him and his wife were here. We were downtown on 8th and Parade. Uh, so this is the first time they've been here. I didn't know it was that long ago. I saw him walk in. I recognized. I knew he'd been here before. And I didn't know it was that long ago. I told him, you know, I told his wife, I said, you know, you're getting old when instead of saying a couple of years ago, you say a couple decades ago, right? So thank you for coming and visiting with us again. And then also would like to welcome Katie Edwards from Erie as well. Good to have you with us. May the Lord bless you. And once you know, you're always welcome here. Come back and be with us as often as you can. All right, we are in Colossians chapter 1. And I'd like to begin reading, and you can follow with me in your Bibles. I'll begin reading at... Uh, verse 9, the Apostle Paul, writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for the Lord's Day. We thank you for a special day where we get together and leave everything else aside and come together under the name of the Lord Jesus and hear the word of God and, and praise you in song and in prayer. And uh, we thank you that we can come and bring our tithes and offerings as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to you. And Heavenly Father, that we can fellowship one with another around the things of God. So thank you for this day. Thank you for this place. Thank you for these people. Thank you for those who are watching and listening. Lord, just bless us all today. I pray that by your Holy Spirit you'd open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person, to receive with meekness the engrafted word. I pray that your word would do its work in our hearts and lives and uh, challenge us today and change us by your power and use us for your glory. We'll thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. The greatest man to ever grace planet Earth was the Lord Jesus Christ the God-man. The second greatest man to ever walk the terra firma was John the Baptist. For the Lord Jesus said of him in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11, he said, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And I think that the next person in greatness would be the Apostle Paul. I can think of no man, past or present, who has given as much, suffered as much, sacrificed as much, or has done as much for the cause of Christ than the Apostle Paul. This great man said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul had the attitude that if he couldn't live for Jesus, he didn't want to live. If he couldn't be profitable to the Lord, then he just wanted to go to heaven, get out of here. For me to live, he said, is Christ, and to die is gain. He said, it'd be better to die and get off this planet than if I'm not going to be used for Jesus, than to stay here and be useless. He's the one who penned Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. He said, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss 
for the excellency of the Lord, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He's the man who recorded his travails in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen what he wrote. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a day and a night have I been in the deep in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. That was his life for Christ. That was his experience. And then he follows that up by calling it a light affliction in 2 Corinthians 4.17. That's incredible. Every time I read that, I'm ashamed of myself. Every time I read that, I think to myself, just a big whiner. I'm a whiner. I whine about this. I whine about that. I complain about this, complain about that. And Paul said, I did all that for Jesus, and it's light affliction. I'm a bum compared to the Apostle Paul. Here in Colossians chapter 1, we find this great apostle penning a prayer for the believers at Colossae. And what was the character of his prayer? What was the nature of his prayer? When he was praying, was he praying for some physical healing for the Colossians? Was he praying for some material need? Was he praying for a financial blessing? No. But it's all we hear today. All we hear about on on the TV preachers and the, the famous guys, all we hear about is praying for money and praying for needs and praying for material things. But when Paul prayed for the Colossians, he prayed for none of that. You know what he prayed for? He prayed that they might know the will and wisdom of God and have spiritual understanding. He prayed that they might walk worthy of the Lord Jesus. He prayed that they might be strengthened by God's power to be patient in their sufferings. He prayed that they might be thankful to God. All believed that the physical and the material and the financial would prove inconsequential if the spiritual was what it should be. So Paul said, I'm going to pray for your spiritual needs, and if those are met, all these other needs won't seem to be so pressing. We do the opposite. I'm right there with you. Right? We're praying for all that stuff, and if we're not where we're supposed to be spiritually... What well, really, in the end, what good's all that? Right. And then he finishes the chapter with the telling of the greatest salvation which the Lord Jesus Christ provided for lost sinners by his death, his shed blood, his burial, and his resurrection. Amen. Now, this I, he goes on and tells them about the great salvation that they have in Christ. And this was no doubt done so that he could encourage them, so that he could uplift them, and so that they would share this wonderful gospel with those around them. And before I move on, dear listener, I want to ask you a question. Whether you're sitting in this room, whether you're watching or whether you're listening, I want to ask you this question. Have you considered the destiny of your eternal human soul? Have you thought about the destiny of your eternal soul beyond this faint and falsely fading life? Where will you spend eternity? Have you thought about it? Have you considered it? Have you considered what the Bible has to say about it? The Bible says we're all of sin and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner, just like me. Just like everyone that's ever been born on planet Earth except the Lord Jesus. We're all sinners. And then he says, the wages of sin is death. The reason we die is because of sin. The reason we have old folks' homes, and the reason we have fire departments, and the reason we have police departments, and the reason we have hospitals, and the reason we have mortuaries is because of our sin. 
all of sin to come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 talks about what's called the second death. And the Bible tells us that whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And there's a first death, which is physical, but there's a second death, which is a spiritual death, the existence of our eternal soul in a place called the lake of fire forever and ever and ever because of our sin against God. I don't, you say, I don't believe that. Doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, it's still true. You can close your eyes and close your ears and just refuse to accept that. It won't change it. Truth is truth, reality is reality. You either face up to it or you just ignore it at your own peril. Jesus said in John chapter 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Listen, we need to be born again spiritually to be alive spiritually, just like we were born physically to be alive physically. And Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So listen, if you're watching or you're listening or you're here today and you've not been born again, Jesus said you won't even see the kingdom of God. You won't even get a glimpse. And then John records in chapter 1, he said, but as many as received him, speaking of the Lord Jesus, to them gave me power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And so God tells you you need to be born again, then he tells you how to be born again. He tells you why you need to be born again, and then he tells you how to be born again. By receiving Christ as your Savior. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And the Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Jesus himself saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, you should consider because eternity depends on what you do with Jesus, which is called the Christ. You can know about him and not be saved. You can go to church and not be saved. You can pray and not be saved. You can give and not be saved. You can be baptized and not be saved. You can light candles and not, you can do all those things and die and go to hell. A very religious person because you know what salvation isn't religion it's a relationship it's a relationship with God as his child through faith in Jesus Christ and having experienced a new birth Amen. you need to consider that I just want you to think about it if you've never been saved you're not born again you don't know for sure you're going to heaven. just think about it so I started by talking about great men like the Lord Jesus Christ the God man John the Baptist and Paul the Apostle and throughout Scripture, we read of great men and women and not so great men and women. We read about the faithful and not so faithful, the godly and the ungodly, the profitable and the unprofitable. And the Apostle Paul wrote about several men who represent different kinds of Christians, kinds of Christians that existed in his day, kinds of Christians that have existed down through history, and kinds of Christians that exist today. And each was the result of their heart relationship with Christ. Let's take a few minutes to look at these men and discover which of them we are most like. And then let's think about which one of them we want to be most like. And then let's determine that we're going to do what needs to be done so we can be more like one of these fellows we're going to look at today. First one is found in Colossians, just a couple pages to your right, chapter 4, verse 14. I call, my first point is this, the sellout. 
the sellout. Look at Colossians 4.14. The Apostle Paul writing, I can imagine with tears in his eyes, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. He's writing to the Colossians, and he's saying, listen, Luke is with me, and Demas was with me, and uh, I want to introduce to you this young man as one of my helpers. He and Dr. Luke have been traveling companions with the Apostle Paul. I can just imagine what it must have been like to travel with Paul and to hear his preaching and to see all the things that God was doing through this man and with this man. He saw people getting saved. He saw churches being started. He saw God providing in miraculous ways. And he saw the example of the great apostle Paul himself. And we find Demas once again in Philemon chapter 1 verse 24 and he's listed there as one of Paul's fellow laborers. And so here we find him, he's a helper of Paul and then the Philippians introduced to him and he's called a fellow laborer. This young man had the privilege to travel with and minister with one of God's choicest servants. To see things and hear things and experience things that so few ever would. He has the love of the Apostle Paul. He has the confidence of the Apostle Paul. He has the trust of the Apostle Paul. And the next time we read about him is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you'd like to turn there. We read about him again. And this time it's a sad verse. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, the Bible says, For Demas hath forsaken me. Can you feel the heartache? And Demas hath forsaken me, having loved the present world. The young man that Paul had included among his fellows has now forsaken him. Now we do not know in what specific way Demas deserted Paul, or for what specific reason Demas deserted Paul, but we we do know in general, the Bible says he forsook the Apostle Paul, and thereby the gospel ministry that he was involved with, with the Apostle Paul, for this general reason, having loved this present world. There was something, there was something or someone in this present world that came between Demas and the Apostle Paul and Demas and the Lord Jesus. Something had caught his eye, something had caught his heart, something had caught his attention, something was so, such a powerful draw from the world upon this young preacher boy that he was pulled away. And forsook the Apostle Paul. God doesn't tell us what it was. But it was something. You see, Demas started out well. Better than most. But he ended up a sellout. I'm not trying to be mean here on Demas. Because my dear friends, if we're not careful, we'll go the same way Demas went. I'm just trying to say this is what Paul said about him. This is what the Holy Spirit has recorded about him. He was a sellout. He was willing to sell out for the world. He closed up shop and relocated from being in the way to being out of the way. And I've seen more Demases than I've cared to over the years. People who get saved and get going for God and they grow and they serve and they're a real blessing and a helper in the ministry. A fellow laborer with Christ only to be enticed by some facet of the world and leave. I want to tell you, it's a heartbreak. This pastor knows what I'm talking about. It's a heartbreak. You think you'll get over it. You think, you know, somewhere along the way, after decades of serving, you'd think that you could just say, ah, but it never works that way. When anyone leaves after being saved and growing and serving and being a helper and a blessing, and they walk away, it tears your heart out. Every time. 
That's how Paul felt. Forsaken. The word in the, Engl- in the Greek is enkat alipo. It means to leave behind. It means the demons just left Paul behind. He just said, forget you, pal. I'm on my, I'm out of here. He just walked away. Left their ministry. Left their pastor, left their church. They sell out for the things of the world, the trends of the world, and the temptations of the world. Something happens. Something changes. And they find the world and its people and its places and its pleasures and its possessions more desirable than the things of God. Oh, it can be a number of things that initiates their desertion. But the underlying issue is according to to the Holy Spirit right here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. The underlying reason is love. Look what it says. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas was saved, yes. And according to what we understand, he served with the Apostle Paul for just over five years. But in the end, he loved the world more than he loved the Lord. And when the time came where push came to shove, he chose to side with the world instead of with the ministry. What a shame. What a sellout. And what a sad day for the Apostle Paul, not to mention the Lord Jesus. I wonder how Jesus felt. I mean, Paul was a great man and all, but he didn't die for... Demas. Paul was a great fellow labor and all, but he didn't shed his blood for Demas. Paul was a wonderful apostle, but he didn't get buried and rise again from the dead for Demas. I want to ask you, are you a sellout? Will you be a sellout? Will you be attracted by the glimmer of the world or enticed by the ways of the world, and turn your back. Let me ask you this, what, are you, what would you be willing to sell out for? Yeah, Demas, the sellout. I want to show you another guy. He's in 3 John chapter 1, please. 3 John chapter 1. See, it's not necessarily how you start out, <clears throat> it's how you end. <laughs> and that... Let's go, to, let's go to 3 John chapter 1. There's only one chapter, but chapter 1, verse 9. There's another man here. I call him the showboat. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes... Now, he loved something else. See, Demas loved what? The world. And it says here that Diotrephes loved what? He loveth to have the preeminence among them. Receiveth us not. Here we're introduced to a man named Diotrephes. <clears throat> what do we know about this man? Well, we know from this verse that Diotrephes was full of himself. It says here that he loveth to have the preeminence among the brethren. That word preeminence in the Greek is philopratio. It means to be fond of being first. To be fond of being first. Diotrephes had to have and get all the glory for himself. He was reluctant to have the Apostle Paul come to his church. Look what it says there. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Paul wrote to the church, said, hey, I'm coming along that way. And the custom of that time was for these traveling preachers to come to the church, and the church would take them in, and they'd feed them, and they'd house them, and they'd hear their preaching and be taught by them and received whatever they had to give them, and then they'd send them on their way. And so he wrote to the church and said, hey, I'm going to be coming that way, me and my guys, and uh, we'd like to stay with you for a while. And Diotrephes said, uh-uh. Now, John is writing to a man named Gaius this letter. And Gaius had received the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote, you know, Paul wrote to Gaius. Gaius said, yeah, come on up. But when he wrote to Diotrephes, Diotrephes said, no.
there are some who just have to have the spotlight. Those who always must have the last word, who always know everything, and always must be right, and always must have their own way. The atrophies. They think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. And they esteem themselves better than others. You know, I've seen some diatrophies in my day. Sometimes they want to be the pastor without having to be the pastor. <laughs> right? Sometimes they want to be the pastor without taking on the responsibilities of the pastor. They want the glory, but not the gore. They want the honor, but not the headaches. They want the rewards, but not the responsibilities. I've known churches that were run by some diatrophies. And whether the diatrophies was running everything because he was wealthy or because he had a position in the community or because he had an overwhelming personality or what it was, I don't know. I don't know, but I've, I've known churches where there was a diatrophies that was running the show. I've known churches that never had a pastor because some diatrophy who could not submit himself to the leadership of another, ruled the assembly. I've known churches where Diotrephes would not allow guest preachers or missionaries to speak for fear that they might upstage him. When you talk with Diotrephes, it's always about him. I've known pastors who have acquiesced to diatrophies because they were afraid of the trouble diatrophies would cause if he did not have the preeminence in the church or did not have the preeminence in decisions. But when we read Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, we find that Christ is to have the preeminence in all things. The pastor doesn't get the preeminence in all things. Jesus gets the preeminence in all things. Diotrephes wanted that which was reserved for another. But you know what I find very interesting about 2 Timothy chapter 4 and Colossians 1.18? They both use the word preeminence in the English, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10, it's a different Greek word than what's used in Colossians 1.18. And here's the difference. In 2 Timothy 4.10, we have the word Philip Rotio. It means, now listen, to be fond of being first. But in, Col in Colossians, where it talks about Jesus, it uses the word Proteuo, which means to be first. Did you catch the difference? You see, Jesus is first. There's no discussion. There's no competition. Jesus is Lord. He is God. He is first. He doesn't have to reach to be first. He doesn't have to compete to be first. He doesn't have to try to be first. He doesn't have to be fond of being first. Why? Because he is. But Diotrephes was fond of being first. See? He wanted a position and a place that was not his. Jesus is first because that's his. It is nothing to be grasped at for Jesus. But it was for Diotrephes. I want to ask you this question. Do you have to have the last word? Do, you, do, you, do your ideas have to be adopted? Well, I'm leaving that church. Why? Well, I gave my opinion and nobody did what I wanted them to do, so I'm out of here. Okay, Diotrephes. How long do you think you're going to stay at the next church? Do you have to be recognized and lauded in order to serve? Well, nobody around here ever thanks me. Nobody around here ever cares about me. Nobody ever... Mumble, 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 mumble. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Now listen, we ought to give honor where honor is due. I understand that. Everybody needs a pat on the back. Amen? 
Everybody needs an attaboy once in a while. But if that's what you're living for, you're just Diotrephes. It's all about you. When it should be all about Jesus. You know, sometimes, you know, Jesus came and he lived uh, with nothing and he died with nothing and he was, he was scoffed and mocked and mutilated. And we think we're supposed to have a band playing in front of us everywhere we go. Sometimes we're going to have to serve and serve and serve and get no thanks and no attaboys and no kudos, but we're doing it for Jesus. We wouldn't, do it, we wouldn't put up with that with anybody else, but we'll do it for Jesus. Why? Because of what he's done for us. You see, D- Demas was a sellout. And Diotrephes was a showboat. But I want to show you the third man. And he's in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 15, and I call this man sold out. Sold out. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, look at verse 15, the Apostle Paul writing, the Holy Spirit testifying through the pen of Paul, says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus? That it was the first fruits of Achaia? And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Here we meet a man named Stephanus. And Stephanus, according to chapter 1, was baptized by the Apostle Paul. So apparently Paul had led this man to Christ and Paul had baptized this man. And what we learn about Stephanus in verse 15 of this chapter is that he and his house addicted themselves to the ministry. Amen. Wasn't just Stephanus. It was Mrs. Stephanus and all the little Stephanuses. They all just said that we're going to addict ourselves to the ministry. The word addicted is tosso in the Greek. It means assigned, determined, disposed. In other words, the entire family of Stephanus determined that their lives would be wrapped up in the ministry of the gospel of Christ. The entire family, I don't know, maybe they had a family meeting. Maybe they got together and old Papa Stephanus sat everybody down and said, now, your mom and I, we, we, we've dedicated our lives to Christ and we're addicting ourselves in a ministry. And all in favor say aye. And they all went, aye. All opposed. <laughs> Couldn't hear a peep. They all said, you know what? We are disposed to serving God. That's what we think about. That's what we pray about. That's what we talk about. Serving God. Ministering to the saints. Doing something that honors and glorifies Jesus Christ. That's what their lives were all about. The whole family. Now that's a family you, boy, that's a family you want to join your church, amen? Amen. The whole family walk in. What can we do? (laughs) Who, you, dad? No, my wife, my kids, all of us. We want to do something. Who can we help? Where can we serve? They were disposed to serving wherever, however, whenever, and by whatever they could. Look at chapter 16, verse 17, the next verse. That ye submit yourselves unto such. Verse 16. And to everyone that helpeth us. In other words, look, these are the kind of people that other Christians are supposed to emulate. And then verse 17 says, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaeus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. When Paul needed something, who showed up? Stephanus. Here he's mentioned as supplying that which was the responsibility of others to provide. So here's the kind of guy Stephanus was, his whole family. Stephanus is, you know, he's at home, he's sitting at dinner with his kids and his wife, and he says, hey, 
He said, man, Paul's down there in prison, and he needs some, he needs some stuff, and, and, uh, and nobody's going down. Nobody's going down. I mean, where, what's going on? His wife said, well, then why don't, you go, why don't you go down? And the kids said, yeah, Daddy, why don't you go down? He said, what should I take them? And Mama said, here, take them this. And the kids said, here, take them that. He said, all right, I'm leaving. Packed up and went down to the Apostle Paul, and he brought the supplies that the rest of the church should have supplied, others wouldn't supply. Stephanus and his family said, we'll take it upon ourselves. We'll sacrifice in order that we can go and minister to Paul. Why? Because that's what we're all about. That's what we're all about. When others let down, Stephanus stepped in. When others shrugged, Stephanus tugged. Look at verse 18. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. This kind of a person, and this kind of a family, is a refreshment to the spirit of the Apostle Paul and a refreshment to the spirit of the church. Why? Because they're a blessing. Stuff gets done. Stephanus was sold out to the ministry of Christ. Did Stephanus have a family to worry about and provide for? Yes. But they addicted themselves to the ministry too. He had a yard to mow. He had a house to keep up. He had kids to take care of. He had a wife. But there he was, serving the Lord. He did not use the others as an excuse or reason why he could not be about the ministry. I'm just talking about Stephanus. I mean, we talked about Demas, the sellout. He ran off, left Paul behind, turned his back and said, I love the world. We had Diotrephes. He said, I love me. And everybody else has to love me. Now he finds Stephanus. He says, I love the Lord. I love the Lord above everything else. And you know what? I can't help it. I'm addicted. I got to be there. I can't help it. I got to help. I'm addicted. I can't help it. I got to serve. I'm addicted. I can't help it. My whole family's this way. We're addicted to the ministering of the saints. He, he loved God. As a matter of fact, his family encouraged him in it and helped him with it. Now, I've known some Stephanuses over the years. Men and women who saw the ministry as important enough to addict themselves to it without neglecting their own responsibilities. But it takes effort. It takes energy. It takes sacrifice. But they saw that it was worthy and found in it their reward. Stephanus is refreshing, encouraging, supporting, and a real help and blessing to the ministry, to the man of God, and to the church at large. Let me ask you, dear believer here today, what are you addicted to? What are you addicted to? What are you disposed to? What have you determined your life is all about? What have you determined that you're going to chase for the rest of your life? First and foremost. Something has your priorities. Something is at the top of your list. And something is worthy of your extra effort. What is it? Demas said the world. And Diotrephes said, me. And Stephanus said, the ministry of Jesus Christ. Amen. Stephanus got the best bargain. He was sold out. Paul mentioned by inspiration of the Spirit three men. Demas the sellout, Diotrephes the showboat, and Stephanus who was sold out for the Lord. Which one are you most like as you sit here today? Which one do you want to be most like? And which one will you choose to make the changes to be more like? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As we think about the things that we have read and heard today, let me ask you this. You're here and you're saved. You're a born-again Christian. You know for sure you're going to heaven.
Would you lift your hand up? This is a flag. This is a testimony. And, and kind of wave it to heaven saying, yes, I know I'm saved. I'm glad of it. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You can put them down. I want to ask you a couple questions. First of all, you know what you need to do, don't you? You know what decision or decisions need to be made today in your heart and in your mind and in your life. God's been dealing with you about it. He's been talking to you about it. He's been pulling on your heart about it. You know what changes need to be made in your life. Would you let the Lord Jesus have the preeminence and come and talk to him about it this morning and surrender to his loving will? And if you're here this morning and you couldn't raise your hand a minute ago, or maybe you're watching or listening and you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, you've never been born again, you heard about the salvation that God's provided for you in Christ Jesus. And you know what you need to do to be saved. You know that you're not going to heaven if you were to die today. And you know what you need to do. You need to trust Christ as your Savior. Do it. Do it now before it's eternally too late. And maybe you're here in this room this morning and you say, Preacher, I heard what you said and I believe it. It's in the Bible. And I know I need to be born again. I need to be saved. Listen, my friend, you can be born again right where you sit. It's a transaction between you and God when you receive Christ as your Savior, confessing that you're a sinner to Him. Oh, my friend, maybe right where you sit, you'd say, Preacher, I'd like to trust Christ right where I'm sitting. I'll help you with it if you want me to. But look up at me if that's your desire. You look up at me, and it's just you and me. Everybody else's heads are bowed. You look up at me, and when I see you looking, I'll know that you want to be saved today. You want to stay right where you are and trust Christ as your Savior, and you want me to help you with it. Anybody like that here today? I want you to look up at me. Make sure I can tell you're looking at me. I'm looking around. If I missed you, raise your hand up a little bit. Say, you missed me, preacher. I'm right here. Anybody like that at all? Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the great salvation that you provided in Christ. And Lord, we can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't make any promises to get it. We just receive it as a free gift. But Father, once we become saved, we enter into a special relationship with you. And we have choices to make as to what kind of Christians we're going to be. Are we going to be a Demas? Are we going to be a Diotrephes? Are we going to be more like a Stephanus? And that is dependent upon our heart relationship with you as our Savior and as our God and as our Father. Would you help us today as Christians to make those changes and choices we need to make? And Father, would you help anyone in this room who needs to be saved to have the courage to come and meet me so we can help them. Guide and direct my Father in the invitation. We'll give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn. And our closing hymn is number 535, Room at the Cross. There's room at the cross for you. My friend, if you need Christ as your Savior, I'm going to be standing right up here in the front. You have questions? We'd be glad to have someone sit down with you and share with you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Christian, you hear the altars open. Why don't you come and talk to the Lord? He's talked to you. Now you come talk to him, would you? We're going to sing on the first, 535. You come as the Lord leads. Cross upon which Jesus stands is a shelter in which we can hide and its grace so free is sufficient for me and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. All right, we're going to sing that second stand. If you need to be saved, you have questions. If you're, if you're a man, we'll have a man go with you. If you're a lady, we have a lady here ready to take you aside to show you carefully clearly from the scripture how you can be saved. No pressure.
then that's no good. Just information. You come and see me as we start singing. If you're here this morning and you've been born again, but you've never been scripturally baptized by immersion, Bible method of baptism, and it's always after a person gets saved to show their death, burial, and resurrection with Christ, into which they entered when they trusted Him as Savior. If you need to get baptized, we're going to have a baptism right after we finish this song. If you'd like to be included in that, you come and see me. If you've already made arrangements, at this time we start singing, I want you to come and sit right here. If you'd like to be included, you come and see me, all right? Otherwise, Christian, the altar is open. Demas, Diotrephes, or Stephanus, what do you need to do? Come and get God's grace as we sing on the third. The hand of my Savior is strong And the love of my Savior is long Through sunshine or rain Through loss or in gain The blood flows from Calvary To cleanse every stain There's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you though millions have come there's still room for one yes there's room at the cross for you all right amen here's what we're gonna do um, we're going to have a word of prayer to close, and then we're going to, we're going to go get ready for baptism. Mark will lead you in a couple songs. Uh, if, if you can stay, we'd appreciate that. It is a public <coughs> baptism, so we'd like to have a public. And you can stay and be the public, public profession of Christ. And uh, so you can stay. If you have to leave, I understand, but uh, if you can stay, please do so. Um, so I'm going to ask Mark to close us in prayer, and then uh, we'll sing some songs. Thank you, Father God, for the message that we heard this morning, Lord, of the three men as Pastor brought them out to us, Father God. And uh, maybe sometimes all three of them are a little part of us, Father God. And help us to see that in our lives, Father God. And help us to be like the house of Stephanus, Lord, that we would serve you and have a desire to stay on this side of the fence, Lord, and not dabble with the world, Father God, and allow its influences to influence us in the wrong way, Father God. It's so easy. It's always attacking us, Father. We need the strength and power of the Holy Spirit to withstand and fight that in our lives, Father God. So where changes need to be made, help us make them, Father God, through the power of your Holy Spirit. We just give you the praise and glory and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Amen.